Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 112 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am your host, Prabhaz Ahma, joined as always by my co host, Omar Ansari. Assalamu Omar. How are you? Welcome, Sam Parvez. Welcome, Sam listeners. It's uh, it's good to connect. It's been a while. It has been a while. It's actually been uh, a little over a month. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, Ramadan was winding down, uh, Eid, and then uh, I think you and I both just got really busy uh, and we were trying to schedule a guest and whatnot. So uh, anyway, um, how, how, how are things been? I guess we should catch up our listeners as to where we are for those who if anybody out there cares. Yeah, I mean, it's been, as always, I always say that the weeks after Ramadan, after uh-huh. Eid, uh, Eid al-Fitr, go by really fast because all of a sudden you got to start like thinking about meals and feeding the kids again and all those sort of things. You're getting more sleep, actually. So you're actually, your days are probably shorter instead of like those five, six hour uh, sessions. And you're actually getting normal sleep. So yeah, the time goes by really fast. It's It's been really hectic. But good, and good. coffee, uh, as I point to my cup of coffee that I'm still uh, that I'm working on. So uh, I know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's uh, always I, nice. It's uh, it's 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 nice to, to drink the coffee. Then and then within a few days, I'm like, oh man, I am drinking way too much coffee. That that whole that whole uh, idea of like toning down after Ramadan never yeah. happened. You like go back to where you were, and then some. Yeah, no, I know you've been on the road as well. You've been traveling. Uh, so, yeah, t- how was your trip uh, back home to Spokane to watch? Yeah, Spokane was good right, at, right after Eid, um, which which was – Eid, by the way, was was nice. It was the first time being in a masjid um, aside, you know, aside from those one, one, one-offs, two-offs. Uh, I know you've been doing Jummah, but for me it was the first time really being in a in like a regular prayer in, in a while. Um, but it was real nice. It was outdoor, uh, which I really loved. I loved the outdoor. I'm thinking, hey, outdoor going forward is the way to go. Straight up. But, but, uh, uh, especially uh, out, uh, especially where we live, yeah, in our neck of the woods. Oh, right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah you can say can that for everybody. Yeah, <laughs> but you can definitely pull that off here. And I, I agree. I, it was like a welcome change. Um, we are at the point right now, I mean, obviously it's been a couple of weeks since uh, Eid, but uh, uh, where mosques have opened up almost fully, like no capacity limits, Mm-hmm. Um, not asking for people to pre-book. So, you know, again, there's a sense of return to normalcy. Um, I know I think last time we were talking um, uh, three out of four on your side uh, vaccinated uh, or in the process. Um, and same mm-hmm. with, with us, it's four out of four, but um, our youngest is still one dose sh- short. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My 14 my year old uh, got her second yesterday. So, oh, wow. How's she doing? So- she's not she's not feeling like she did the first time so that's so that's good but uh, no i mean in terms of return to normalcy like i said i visited my parents in spokane as you referred to earlier for the first time since last summer and then um believe it or not i took the kids to disneyland which was a, just a blast that was that was fun so two days seeing i was telling them you're seeing more people now than you've probably seen in in a while uh probably since the pandemic and they had they had a blast they had an absolute blast so, uh, how, like, how was that like? I mean, like, I love the euphemism. Like, I, I use it too, like taking the kids to Disneyland because it's as much of a wonderful trip for me too. And, and we'll get into that. But I want to, like, I guess from a high level, like, you had to secure a spot. They were limited capacity. How was that like? I guess well, before I even go there, I have to. I'm laughing about that comment about for the kids because literally, I'm like, guys. I don't care what, but before we do anything, we're going to Star Wars Galaxy, Star Wars uh, Galaxy's Edge. They're like fine, and and I kind of made that like a, a priority. Um, no, it was it was it was a blast. I mean, some things were closed. The character there were no characters uh, yeah. to meet, whether it's stormtroopers or princesses. Um, but oh just, no, no, uh, no, 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 like stormtroopers walking around like in Galaxy's Edge. Uh, no, no stormtroopers uh, and no princesses for the little one. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the third capacity, it was like, man, when are we going to ever get to go to Disneyland where it's not, you know, jam-packed with people? The lines were still pretty de- pretty long because they had to socially distance the lines. And okay. the rides couldn't necessarily be filled to capacity. Okay. Some some rides are already built where they're, you're separate. So they some rides were just going really fast. Others kind of took, you know, the usual 30 to 45 minutes. Nothing was over an hour which is nice. in some cases, you know, expected in, in Disney. And so overall, it's a blast. Um, first time back in 10 years. So, um, you know, my little one who's, who's eight, she had never been. So she, she had a blast too. It was, it was great. 
Okay, so enough with the vicariously living through the shoulder. <laughs> I got to ask you, how yeah. was Galaxy's Edge for you? How was any highlights? Like, you remember the uh, Millennium Falcon? Right? The Millennium Falcon was cool. Unfortunately, the whole Rise of the Resistance thing, I couldn't get into that queue, which was a little disappointing. Um, and on top of that, Avengers Land um, opened like the day after we went. So well, it's oh. just, I guess it's a reason to go back in, in California Adventure. So oh, yeah, to, we'll I heard back. about that. They mm-hmm. did that, didn't they? Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen anything or heard anything, so I don't know. But just uh, it is cool. Galaxy's Edge, like going back to Galaxy's Edge, just kind of walking around. Um, I don't know if you went to like the lightsaber factory, the droid factory, <laughs> you know, things like that. Like I don't know if yeah. your kids. Uh, I, I got again for the kids. I I I, built, I I didn't do the I didn't do the lightsaber uh, because the price tag was pretty high. But I did. We do have a little droid uh, that 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 that's that can be you know around the yeah. house and, and terrorize the cats. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and now seven right. years, kids' school ended um, already. I know some folks are not ending till end of June, but my kids finished their school a couple of days ago, and they're already saying how bored they are. So, welcome to normalcy. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I've got I've got some travel slated ahead of me as well for the summer. Um, also, an exciting news: um, January, June fourteenth. Sorry, June fifteenth is couple of things my daughter is graduating high school which is super exciting um and so my older daughter and then number two i am returning and i put that in air quotes because i've never actually been to my office because i got hired during the pandemic so or i started this job at the, during the pandemic so i'm really excited about going back to the office as it were or going to an office uh and it's going to be like in terms of frequency or cadence they've, they've left it entirely up to the employees because right now this is the phase where it's voluntary mm-hmm. um because we have a we have a no sooner than date of september um and uh, at least for the voluntary phase they are requiring or people who want to be part of that program to be vaccinated and to still wear a face mask, which that's the part that is really a stickler for me, uh, because I don't see the 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 kind of logic behind it. If we're all fully vaccinated, we're in the office, then why yeah. are we back? But anyway, yeah, um, yeah. yeah uh, for me, it was like the like the pros outweighed the cons, and the pros of just being able to be in a collaborative space again that's not mm-hmm. virtual. Uh, and meeting my coworkers for the first time in many cases, right in person. Yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, all in all, um, excited and uh, uh, looks like it's going to be a jam packed summer. Um, and uh, but yeah, as far as uh, the show goes and listeners go, um, uh, expect to uh, hopefully not have to wait another month before our next episode. We've got a lot of guests kind of slated and lined up. Um, we've got some exciting shows that we have in mind. So do stay tuned and do look out for that. Um, and uh, yeah, Omer, in that vein, uh, we are really excited about today's conversation. So why don't you tell us a little bit about our guest? Absolutely. Uh, honored to have Dr. Celine Ibrahim uh, for the show today. Uh, and Dr. Celine Ibrahim, she's the author of Women and Gender in the Quran, uh, published from Oxford University Press uh, last year. She's also the editor of One Nation Indivisible, Seeking Liberty and Justice from the Pulpit to the Streets, uh, published the previous year. And her current work project is on the concept of monotheism in the Quran and in Sla- Islamic intellectual history. So um, Dr. Ibrahim she definitely has a lot to say. A lot to say about some very interesting topics in on gender in the Quran. She is very qualified, mashallah. She has a um, uh, master's degree for, in women's and gender studies and Near Eastern and Judaic studies from Brandeis. She has a master's of divinity from Harvard and a bachelor's degree with highest honors from Princeton. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim is a trusted public voice on issues of religion and civic engagement. She's deeply committed to countering counteracting bigotry and fostering values of pluralism, integrity, and civic responsibility. And we are absolutely honored to have Dr. Ibrahim on the show today. So thank you, Dr. Ibrahim, or do you prefer to go by Celine? How do you want us to uh, call you? That's and wonderful. Interact with you? Let, let's go with Celine. <laughs> Celine. Okay. Well, w- welcome Celine, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, Professor Ibrahim uh, to the show. We are so delighted to have you. Um, I read your book in uh, in earnest, and uh, I, I got a chance to also uh, see some of your more recent um, sort of podcast media appearances. You know, but it's funny, actually, the first time you ever kind of came across my radar, even before you reached out via email, was I 
saw a lecture and I don't know if it was live streamed or I saw a recording of it um, that you gave uh, for Zaytuna College. Um, yes. Was that, was that recorded on the West Coast? Did you visit the Bay Area or was it one of those in, in community, you know, out in the community Zaytuna events? No, I had the for- good fortune of, of coming to Zaytuna and it's a, such a blessed place and the spirit there is just incredible. So I, it wasn't my first time visiting and hopefully it won't be my last either, inshallah. Inshallah, that's right. Uh, and we missed you. Uh, was, so it was like a public lecture that you gave at that event. Mm-hmm. Zaytuna oh, okay. has a series where, you know, I'm sure it's on pause during these times, or it's probably been taken more online, where there is a community outreach program. And so uh, there's, I, I think it's a wonderful asset to the community. They really do bring in a number of speakers, and not just on Islamic topics, but really a range of, of themes in the humanities, all public yeah, programs. Right. We've been very lucky. Um, you know, as you, as, as you know, we, Omar and I are in the Bay area and, uh, you know, of course, you know, it's been over a year since I've attended a Zaytuna event. Speaking of Zaytuna events, interestingly enough, the last event I attended, uh, pre lockdowns was actually Zaytuna's annual fundraiser, uh, which happened to be held at the Fairmont hotel in San Jose. And that was like literally a week before Santa Clara County and neighboring counties went on shelter, shelter in, in place, you know, um, essentially lockdown mode. And so, um, but it's good that, it, I mean, here we are recording in Ramadan. Um, there are, you know, communities have slowly started reopening. Uh, I know, I, I would imagine in California, probably similar to the East Coast, we've been taking a very gradual, very sort of safe and systemic uh, approach to the reopenings. But uh, uh, you are joining us today from the East Coast. I just want to make our listeners. Yes, start. from the greater Boston area and actually southern New Hampshire at the moment. Oh wow! Uh, approaching, yeah. The summer is always great in in the fall or, or in the uh, in the uh, in the New England area, but I, I, I especially love the fall, as I imagine you do as well. Yeah. Are you from? Certainly. Are you from the East Coast? I grew up in a rural place in Pennsylvania, and from there, then I attended a school in New Mexico. So I've experienced kind of living in in that part of the country as well, and then I came back to the East Coast for for college. Actually, I think it's a great place for us to kind of officially start. We often like to talk about people's people's origin stories, um, and so you know, I, and I, I, I take it um, just gleaning from your biography, you have a fascinating one. So I'd love for you to kind of maybe yeah talk about your experiences growing up. Um, you uh, come into the faith, so you are uh, you, you know you're as, as someone who converted to Islam. I would love to kind of, you know, you don't need to, we don't need to necessarily do a deep dive, but as as open as you are, as comfortable as you are talking about sort of your experiences, what brings you to Islam, and then we'll get into sort of the academic study of Islam uh, later, but I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, in my youth, I was very active in a Catholic church, and my priest preached what I now know to be liberation theology that was very much committed to the poor and the suffering, and he himself modeled that. He'd be in contact with death row inmates and would make regular trips down to Latin America to um, support uh, churches down there, and he was very informative for me as someone who, you know, growing up in a small town, I didn't have too many people who had a wider outlook on life and and his passion and commitment just really inspired me. And so I think from from that example, from from his preaching of liberation theologies, when I came to Islam and I was able to see in Islam a lot of what I really appreciated in Christianity, but minus the thing that never made sense to me quite well in Christianity, which you know, which is that concept of the Trinity, uh, which the, the Quran you know de- definitely does not have, and in fact refutes. And but I I appreciated so much in my religious upbringing, you know, many things, not just the liberation theology, but also that deep well of spirituality and being able to connect. Um, to and with uh, a higher human purpose. And that, so yeah, that's, I think was, was super formative on my life. And I also at at some point had a chance to practice meditation with a Zen Buddhist monk for two years. And that helped me in my spirituality develop that sense of kind of patience 
and perseverance. You know, when you're sitting, when you're doing a sitting meditation and you you want to move, but you kind of come on that urge. It's a similar skill for when you're lying in bed and the alarm goes off and you want to wake up for fudger, but you just have to kind of push yourself that extra bit. And so my, yeah, my, I think somewhere between that Catholic priest and that Buddhist monk <laughs> is my, my um, spirituality developed. Yeah. Uh, uh, wow. That, yeah. I, I love to hear kind of that, that, that kind of ecumenical approach to spirituality, to connecting with the divine. Uh, I, I find it so refreshing. Um, and I, I really appreciate you sort of speaking candidly about it um, because I feel like sometimes Muslims are a little reticent to talk about explorations uh, into other faith traditions, uh, whether they do so prior to their acceptance to Islam, if they're converts or, you know, frankly, if you're born Muslim, you've been, um, you know, people who meditate or do yoga for uh, meditation purposes, uh, in addition to strength training, <laughs> you know, for example, uh, you know, but I, I so I kind of appreciate that candor. Um, so if you could, then maybe, ma you know, uh, sort of hone in or, or, or on or focus for our listeners, what was it in particular that drew you to Islam, um, you know, uh, as a as a faith tradition, and then eventually leading to your um, converting to the faith. And, and when was that in your sort of, in terms of yeah. undergrad, high school? Yeah. I was an undergrad. And the the things that drew me the most, I think, were the linguistic aspects, the, the calligraphy, and the art as well. I was an art student at the time. And just this, this concept, you know, the arabesque, and just this joining point between geometric beauty and, and and aesthetic beauty uh, so those those things made me curious and and drew me in and probably it was also I was traveling at the time through Egypt and um, was studying abroad in fact a semester at, at the American University of Cairo and that was my first immersion like long-term immersion experience and, and that gave me not just a taste of what Islam was like, but a more sustained, you know, living in and amongst Muslims. And I met during that time period, so many young people who were very wise. And eventually it, it occurred to me that they were wise because they had this deep spiritual practice. Now your undergrad was at, was at Princeton. So you, um, and then you did the uh, study abroad uh, during your undergrad years? Mm-hmm. In my sophomore year, yeah. Okay, and, and were you Middle Eastern studies? Is that were you area studies? Yeah, so I started in anthropology, and I okay. had a minor in finance. I was trying to, you know, make the parents happy, but I did not fit in with the finance kids. I was much more an anthropologist, and so then I moved into Middle Eastern studies. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, and uh, uh, while you were at at Princeton, did you overlap with? people I may know. Um, so like we've had David Coolidge on the program. Uh, and then, uh, my, my a dear friend of mine from Texas, who's a professor at UC Davis, Dr. Mirad Sayed, were you contemporaneous with either of them? So actually, and may, may Allah forgive him uh, of blessed memory. So Heb Sultan came in as the chaplain my very last semester at Princeton. So we crossed paths in that capacity. And Khalid, um, Khalid Latif was the chaplain before that. So I got to spend a, a bit of time with Khalid as he was just uh, starting out in, in his own chaplaincy career, I think. And there's a number of other people, Yusuf Ivali, who for a number of years was the executive director at the Islamic Society of uh, Boston, um, the, the affectionately called the ISBCC. And so, yeah, we, so there was a number of people that actually at that time, I also, at some point when I was studying abroad in Egypt, I met my current, my husband, my only husband, <laughs> the one and the only, just, just in case he hears this. <laughs> um, I have a current wife too. She's the one and only. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so yeah. And I had a daughter, so I, we had a young infant at the time. So I didn't have a whole lot of time for socializing between studying yeah. and no, no, raising totally. a small totally. baby. 
no, I mean, there were area studies, so I thought maybe, but I actually, now that I think about it, some of them may have been religious studies. Um, and I actually, I really appreciate you mentioning uh, Suhaib Sultan. Um, I think I've, 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 I've talked about it on the show. Uh, I can't recall, though. Um, uh, he and I, our, our paths crossed also when he was actually a chaplain at Temple University. Uh, I'm sorry, not Temple. Uh, at, at Trinity? Uh, Trinity College. At Trinity College in Connecticut. Uh, I lived in Western Mass for like a year. And uh, when I first moved out to that community, um, it was actually Suhaib who welcomed me to the community, took care of like, I mean, helped me with my move. Uh, you know, took uh, took my car in because I needed a place to leave my car for a week. I mean, that was just the kind of person Sohaib was. And uh, and then over the year, year and a half that I was able to spend time there in Western Mass, he and I, you know, got to know each other more. And, uh, you know, Mela, bless him. And he was just a really beautiful person. Um, and I imagine those of our listeners who have probably seen on social media recently, you know, a lot of people sort of writing eulogies and reflections on him. And so I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for doing that because I've been w- wanting to do that on the show. And I think having you as someone who interacted with him was perfect. Yes, I think it's good. Your listeners might also want to know that there's a fund, both one to support his family and then also one that is... And my understanding, it's a legacy fund for people interested in Muslim chaplaincy. I think it has to do with with Muslim chaplaincy. Perfect. Um, So, uh, uh, oh, yeah, at Princeton, I mean, did you did your studies uh, interact with uh, Dr. Hussein Mudarasi? Is that? Yes, he he's um, was probably what I would call my first sheikh, <laughs> although I don't know if he would <laughs> he would understand it in those terms, but I took every class he offered and what an amazing soul. And, and um, that's my foundation for understanding Islamic law was, was from his classes and, and just his beautiful example. And at the time too, I had come back from Egypt and I was still in Egypt, I wore a naqab and I kept wearing it when I was in Princeton. And so I think he, of all his students, I think he will definitely remember me because I was probably his only manakaba student at Princeton. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's, um, that's, that's actually really interesting, but the, the resume that you have is super, super impressive, right? Um, the, the, our listeners heard, heard your bio, uh, and you have some really, really impressive credentials. Um, is that coming from your family or was that something you were inspired to pursue uh, post conversion? Oh, that's a great question. So my, my family is just by their nature, very hardworking. And part of the reason I ended up a bit studious was because I could either be working, like doing things around the house with my dad, or if I was studying, I could be excused from doing those things. And we, we had horses. And so there were always chores to do with horses. And we, we just had a lot of gardens, like a large country property. And so the, there was always things to do, but if I was studying, (laughs) then I could get out of the chores. So somewhere between I did develop a work ethic, which that's the good news. Um, but but I I probably um, I probably ended up studious in part trying to get out of work. Yeah, you know uh, it's funny. Uh, you were talking about spending time <clears throat> in Egypt. Um, I actually did a semester abroad as well at AUC um, Cairo, um, or sorry, yeah, AUC. Um, and so, uh, was this when like the campus was in Tahrir, or had yes. the campus already moved? Okay. Yes. And then, were you living in the dorms, or you had found an apartment or something? No, I actually wanted that dorm experience because I lived yeah. in the dorms in Zamalek. Yeah, yep, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, one of the things I remember from that experience was yeah. I, again, I came from country location, so I always had fresh air, and I just yeah. remember even just going from Zamalek to to Tahrir Square. I was like, you could just sense your your breath like being taken away and then you could go home Uh, at night and like wash the smog out of your nose may Allah help us I mean seriously uh I yeah I have I share those experiences although I I have such a I I I just I love Cairo I love the energy there I love spending time there uh I I I probably explored the majority of that city on foot and, and and discovered so many parts of the old city and uh 
in fact, some of the places where you really want to visit, like some of the tombs or what have you, um, uh, of some of the uh, sort of legends uh, of our Muslim tradition, you kind of have to do it by foot. You know, you can't mm-hmm. sort of get there otherwise. Um, uh, I, I, I recently saw a, uh, they, they've, uh, I think, done a great restoration of the uh, mausoleum of Imam Shafi. I don't know if you've seen pictures of that, but it is, it looks stunning. Like nothing like it looked like when you you probably, you were there. And when I was there, um, spent a great deal of afternoons, uh, in, 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 in that mausoleum. And it is breathtakingly beautiful how it is now with the restoration. My my in-laws are still in Egypt. So we're, we're due for a visit. So I'll make sure to put that on our, our agenda. Definitely, definitely, uh, definitely should. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I guess, is it during undergrad then? that you begin to kind of explore. Well, I mean, your book is women in the Quran, gender, women and gender in the Quran. So, I mean, I just by virtue of being a female, I imagine obviously these themes you're already kind of exploring as a, as a believer, as someone new to the faith, but also as someone who's academically studying the faith. Um, but yeah, I'd be curious, you know, what those sort of early, um, what that early, I guess, inception of these ideas and how those percolated and eventually became the project of your uh, of your research. Yeah, and, and, even, I, and even even before the the concept of the book, like even as a new convert, right? Oh, yeah, it, what's the first seed of thinking about the the role of women in Islam, or the um, you know, and what what is eventually you ended up uh, diving deeper into in, in the academics. Yeah, I mean, coming out of the Catholic context, Mary was always a very central figure in in my spiritual life. And of course, it's very different in, in Catholicism than it is in um, in Islam. I used to, in Catholic school, used to pray the rosary and, you know, pray to, you know, astaghfirullah, but pray to Mary for intercession and, and all of these types of things. So it was fascinating for me then to know that Maryam alayhi salam is this blessed figure also in in Islam and in a different way, but, you know, still that, that same figure. So I think, you know, that probably planted a seed, um, you know, way back, but I think it was my studies with Leila Ahmed in grad school that first brought that question of women and gender into the academic lens for me, even when it was already an, an experiential one. And for I mean, uh, Dr. Ahmed's an interesting person because she comes from, you know, from a family who, um, you know, had a, was deeply spiritual, but also was not part of what she would call the establishment Islam in the same way. And so she's very, in her work, very openly critical of, of what she calls establishment Islam and the ways in which there was, as she you know, documents in in her books a uh, an impulse within some Muslim circles to suppress the female uh, contributions to Islam and suppress the you know over regulate female um, you know many aspects of of, <laughs> of woman's <laughs> life. Is she? Uh, I mean, I'm not familiar. Uh, so I think Bavarzi have familiar. You, uh, you you reacted uh, with yeah. a sense of familiar familiarity. But um, for those of us who aren't aware, is she a was she a professor or was she a? Um, yeah. Yes, she just retired actually mm-hmm. recently. So now she's emeritus status. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and so I encountered her at Harvard Divinity School, which is where she taught for the last probably twenty or, or more years, and her. Her work really opened up the field in the Western Academy for women and gender. She's right up there with the likes of um, Dr. Anne-Marie Schimmel, who also broached the topic of women and gender and wrote on Sufi mystics. And um, I think for for Leila Ahmed, too, she also has a fantastic book on the history of veiling in the Middle East and these different cross currents between waves of unveiling and revealing and the different discourses with regard to colonialism. And so she's, if anyone, I mean, her, her works, she comes at this as a scholar, not, you know, from a devotional sphere, but, but her works are certainly seminal in, in the Academy for the study of women and gender. 
Yeah, and, and to Omar's point, yeah, I, I, I was nodding uh, emphatically because I am familiar with her work. I, I was fortunate enough to read uh, a lot of her articles, or cer certainly her seminal work on w women and gender um, uh, as a graduate student, uh, you know, same thing, area studies like you, and it was, a, it was a course in, it was a graduate course in on uh, gender and sexuality in Islam, and, and that was where we came across her work, so um that's, that's amazing. I mean, you, you really got to study with sort of the giants of the field, whether it's Islamic law and modernity mm -hmm. and, and, and Dr. Layla Ahmed. Um, I'm curious, you know, like you mentioned, you know, a few other, like you mentioned, I think you mentioned, uh, uh, was it Anne-Marie Schimmel? I think you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, where does, where does Fatima Mernissi and her work kind of place, like where does her work situate within the area of gender, the, the, I guess the investigation of gender and, and sexuality in Islam, certainly around the female. Uh, and, and so how does that, I, I'm curious because I mean, I know she, her writings tend to be a little bit more polemical. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious just from that. You're, yeah. Yes. And I, I would say maybe her contemporary analog is Asma Lemrabet, who is a Moroccan scholar who writes also on women in Islam. And they are both figures who are somewhat in the academy. You know, they have a foot in the academy, but they're really concerned, I think, much more with the public discourse and public understandings in a way that sometimes academics are. But, you know, there's, I think, a there's a somewhat of a divide between academics who mainly write for other academics and then academics who also see themselves writing for, for public audiences. That, that's a great point. That's a, yeah, I think that's a great point. I, I don't want to get too much into the weeds and, and, and leave off our listeners. So um, I, I, I think we'll pivot from this conversation, but I'm also curious while we're on the subject, um, because as I was reading your book, um, you know, I, I was not only reflecting on my, my experiences reading Dr. Laila Ahmed's work, but also, uh, uh, Dr. Amina Wadud. Now, mm -hmm. again, where would you kind of place her with regards to kind of, again, uh, a, a, you know, a scholar in the field? Yeah, so her first book, Women in Quran, she wrote yeah. that in Malaysia in 1992. And if you pick it up and read it, it still reads deeply meaningful today. So that's a hard thing to do to have a book that 30 years on still has, you know, still reads like it's current. And I got to witness her teaching in a number of different circumstances. And I think there, she has a number of detractors, number of very, very vociferous detractors. <laughs> and, um, I think that's partly easy for them to do because she's a black woman. And um, so I think there is a lot in her detractors. There is a lot of sexism and racism in, in, you know, how entitled they feel to dismiss her entirely. It's one thing to disagree with an established, you know, with, with this, she's a formidable scholar. And I think it's very some people are very quick to dismiss her. And I think it's racist and sexist that, that they do that without engaging her more fully. And so I, I have differences of opinion with her as yeah. I would with, with any, maybe any other person who, you know, has written several books, <laughs> but, but her, yeah. her influence on the field is huge. So and, we've, we've referred, we've referred to a couple of um, different concepts. Um, I want to zoom out maybe to the 50,000 foot view before we get back in <laughs> into some of the, the details. Um, for those of our listeners who are not familiar with the writings of Amina Wadud or the um, the teachings of uh, Layla Ahmed um, and some of the concepts that, that uh, you, 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 know, you write about in your book uh, and, and the lectures you have online and so forth, maybe if we can just go way back out at the 50,000 foot view and, and talk about what 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 are these what are these ideas? Um, a lot of our listeners, you know, are not familiar at all with some of the stuff that you've referred to, and I just want to level set. Um, so maybe you can help us do that. Yeah. So I'll I'll do it this way. In, within, I consider myself pretty much a traditional Muslim within traditionalist circles, and if we look at the history of Islam, yes, we have found women. We find women scholars. We find. Um, you know, women's contributions on every level, we can point to a number of formative women figures without whom, you know, what would the tradition be? And so, 
yes, on the one hand, there's this, but there's also a very relevant critique that points to not just the history of Islam, but we're talking more larger trends and says women consistently get excluded, marginalized. Um, you know, there is a strain of misogyny that runs not just through Islam, but you can point to it in other global religious traditions, philosophical traditions, etc. And so I think, you know, and I do this, I want to do this from within my traditional kind of grounding in, in Islam. And we can talk more about that at a certain point. But I think it behooves us to just listen to, especially women scholars, to the places where the tradition has, is still misogynistic or, you know, to the areas that need attention that in, in, if we look at the history of the tradition have not been given attention because women have not been at the table in the same way. And, and so that's where, you know, that's where I am with a lot of these discourses. So some people would kind of throw the whole thing out and I'm not like that at all. Certainly I wouldn't have written the book I did if I, if I wanted to throw everything out, but it's just, a, it's a, I, I hope my work brings a different perspective on things. And, and a, I don't, I have written on the legal tradition. I'm not specializing in law the same way I once thought I might, but I like stories and that's the genre I mainly focus on because in that sphere of the narrative, you can reclaim things, you can reclaim the feminine voice a lot easier than going up against kind of an entire edifice of law that is very technical and that has excluded women's contributions in pretty notable ways throughout history. I mean, and in the actual practice of, of law itself. So I can, I can hop in on stories a lot (laughs) easier. It's just like, kind of like a question of where can I be most effective? And that's where I kind of discern that, that, you know, and also from that perspective of how to do pastoral care and how to reach people, stories are, are that entry point, I think. Because you, I mean, you did serve as a chaplain as well. I mean, I know it's something we mentioned in the bio, but certainly, um, you know, that was a role that you've had in the past. I mean, so like you said, pastoral care and the need for stories and narratives to to kind of help, uh, you know, a, a, as you're you know offering pastoral care to people essentially. So, uh, and and the way the way I'm kind of again just kind of as as a layman looking at it and and, and hearing this. I think there is an elephant in the room, right? Which you refer to as that, that history of misogyny. And then there's, how do we respond? Some people get so turned off by it. They actually throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Mm-hmm. That then that the, the other category of response is kind of looking the other way, pretending it doesn't exist or, you know, just shelving it and not focusing on it. But, but what you're doing is you're, um, you're taking it on right head, head on. Right. Um, and you're tackling it from a traditionalist viewpoint and say, Hey, from within the tradition, how can I address right. this in a way that makes sense? Uh, exactly. that will maybe, and maybe it help address some of these questions that the, the, the large number of people have. And you're right. The impulse is to look away. I was once at a table and I was the only woman at that table of a number of prominent American Muslim uh, scholars. And I, you know, I won't name names, but I think the point is I was trying to bring a, you know, bring a perspective and say, look, there's work to be done in including women's voices in the tradition. And I basically said to them, you know, I said, go to your bookshelf, look at your bookshelf. Where are the women writers on your bookshelf? Right. And, and, and I think it has to be that tangible for people to really understand. And why does it matter? So, you know, why does it matter that I might have a book by a woman on my bookshelf. And it's it's the it's a perspective. It's an entire kind of realm of experience that is just getting pushed aside, is is getting lost. And you know, it's a it's a critique that feminists have had to make a number of fields of knowledge where women have historically been thought to be weaker intellectually and you know not emotionally suited for um you know, scholarship and, and all of these things, these ideas, they are, they're bigoted, they're misogynistic, and it's, we have to look at them. And, and it doesn't, it doesn't diminish the tradition that we have to say, maybe there have been gaps in perspective, we just need to face that and move on from there, recognizing that that we can lift up women's voices without somehow destroying the traditional Islam. 
And, and what's a what's a maybe an example of that light bulb moment maybe that you had early on where you said, I've been thinking about it or hearing about it from the main, the quote unquote mainstream this way, didn't jive deep down. I knew didn't something didn't feel right or, and then yeah. I learned something that kind of the light bulb went out and now I'm now that's the new, that's the new reality, the new truth for me that really helps me and my path. Yeah. There has never been a jurisprudence developed around consent, like sexual consent. And if you, there's a, you know, we have the idea that a woman entering a marriage has to either give consent or remain silent. And that counts as her consent. But what about the discourse on, on slave women? And could we, could we look at the prophet's example, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he did have female slaves and proposed, and they did not want to marry him, that he did not, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, force himself upon them. Mm-hmm. And so there's a way in which we could have had a jurisprudence based on sunnah that related to not taking advantage of female slaves, for instance, but we didn't. We didn't get that. And I think would there have been a group of women sitting around the table deriving fiqh, they might have thought of that in a different way. So that's just one example where, you know, where it matters to have women's perspectives and women's voices. You, you know, I, and, and this ties in directly to, uh, you know, your your book and what you write about. Uh, in fact, in the introduction, you, uh, I think the phrase you use is like hermeneutic suspicion. Um, to describe like the gir- the dearth of uh, of I think I think like 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 Muslim exegesis that were actually female right that were actually like like where's the female scholarship in the field of uh, tafsir in the in the field of Muslim ex- m- Muslim exegesis um, but I'm curious like I mean how would you respond to then the pushback that you may get um, that states that, well, the absence of something doesn't necessarily mean exclusion uh, or, you know, like willful exclusion versus just the fact that, for example, as you came across when you're trying to uncover or investigate, um, uh, uh, you know, Muslim exegesis of the Quran and the dearth of like female scholarship in that field. So I'm, I'm, I'd love your thoughts yeah. as a scholar about so the- that. The phrase hermeneutic of suspicion comes from Elizabeth Schussler Firenze, who is a biblical scholar and one of the formative feminist theorists in, in not only feminist biblical studies, but also she writes a lot at the juncture thinking about what empire does to religions. And, wow. and I think that's, it's a, powerful question that I think we have to ask ourselves as Muslims as well. What what did the turn to empire fairly early in, in Muslim history yeah. do to, to the nature of Islam? Uh, so there's lots of work to be done in, in that area. And we've already started to see kinds of um, Muslim liberation theologies and decolonial studies that are seriously taking on this question of empire, not I think it's easy to think about decolonial studies in the context of European um, empire, but I think an, the next logical move is to also look at our, our own um, tradition and its relationship to to political power. That's that's exactly right. It, it, that's a fascinating point you just made because, like, my mind instantly went to, well, I mean, there's been so much writing about sort of like empire within the context of colonial powers and how that impacted the Muslim world, how that impacted Muslim inter- intellectual tradition and and output, but where is the examination about what empire did to a growing and fledgling community that early in its genesis, um, you know, now having to deal with this enormous power, uh, literally decades after the demise of its founder, you know, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so, awesome. so it, it's, that's a fast, yeah, th- that is a fascinating conversation. So I guess if you could venture or tip a toe into that field, like what would you think that we would find with regards to how that impacted more specifically female scholarship as this, uh, you know, burgeoning empire was like sort of growing? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a great question. <laughs> and um, uh, Asma Saeed has a, has a book that 
um, looks at female scholarship and why? Why do you find in the very early people, very early period, women were not, you know, there was not so much book writing per se going on in that very early period, but women were authorities to, they had like a foundational impact that was not just transmission. So even though we find, and it, it's it's fantastic that we can unearth thousands upon thousands of, say, women hadith transmitters, but they, and so they, they had a role, they were keeping alive a particular legacy. But what we find is that women go from um, Aisha, radiallahu anha, you know, us taking half of our, you know, half of our faith, right, in, in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's uh, um, estimation of it from from Aisha radiallahu anha to and then what like yeah, right. in that next in that next generation they were still tremendous teachers women teachers in that generation we can go two three out and we still find esteemed male scholars studying with uh, esteemed women scholars I think of Saidna Nafisa we mentioned Cairo before another yeah that's uh, right blessed uh, the so she would have been the granddaughter of the prophet so right. they use some um, yeah and um, her tomb is also her mausoleum is also right there uh very mm -hmm. close to Imam Shafi's yeah yeah, yeah thank yeah. you um you know that's a, and, I, and I guess I asked the question knowing that I know, at least in one of the chapters, if I recall, Layla Ahmed begins to kind of explore this because, you know, she connects it to, for example, veiling and the parda and, and sort of like, where does veiling, the, like, I guess the more conservative perspectives around that coming from or directly connected to the growth of the empire into territories that were far more conservative when it came to gender than uh, the uh, seventh century in seventh century Arabian context. Well, we even find in the seventh century Arabian context a difference between Mecca and Medina, for instance, and in, right. in, in terms agriculture of agriculture yes. versus mercantile. Yeah, exactly. So, mm -hmm. I, yeah, and I think I think all these questions. It's it's helpful to look back and to say, you know, where did the current start shifting away from women's authority and women's leadership and in, in all these different domains. Um, that only that gives us a, a historical an historical answer, but it doesn't tell us about our present kind of what we should do. And so, you know, I, I dabble in I dabble in the history. I read the history. I thought about once becoming a historian. I teach history in my current position, but I, I would say my my mind I'm best suited for for kind of thinking about that question of how the past impinges upon the present. And so I see myself much more as a, I, I think maybe you can say a constructive theologian or, or something like this. Uh, and, and that, because sometimes, sometimes it's not just a matter of reviving the past, how it, how it was. Um, I think sometimes we just have to, to make an argument based on what are the needs of the present moment. And the great thing about the way our tradition is set up is that the fiqh can be flexible, that, that we do have a dynamic tradition, that, um, that Islam, you know, the foundations are set, but there's a lot of flexibility in terms of, you know, what things actually you know, look like on, on the ground. So I think we're mm -hmm. we're in this moment of tremendous renaissance with regard to scholarship in in Islam, and I'm very hopeful. I can't um, like I can't read the books as fast as they're coming out. Mashallah, it's just there. There's a huge knowledge production transmission, and yeah, I'm really excited about the present. Do you think the Muslim mainstream, the masses, um, and maybe even it, the answer to this question may differ from country to country in the West versus East, but do you think they well, let's are... Let's focus on, on America then, like yeah, the yeah, community yeah. in America then. Yeah. So do you think people are hungry for this sort of study or are they going to be resistant? Maybe both? Yeah, yeah and, and I mean, I think we do, we can look at the American context and say, we're a very educated Ummah, umma if we look at the, the American Ummah. And we've also had this wonderful experience going through institutions where we've been forced to encounter different types of Islam and people from all sorts of countries and backgrounds. And, um, you know, on the one hand, we do see some turn to secularization and, and you know, that is a real issue that's on, on our horizon as American Muslims. But on the other hand, if we look at our 
civic culture, it's flourishing right now. We, If we look at the kind of brick and mortar establishments, we're doing a fantastic job. And, you know, staffing is maybe the issue now and having some type of kind of more professional edifice uh, in addition to the physical edifice. But we're, we're moving in the right direction on all of these questions. Our institutions, we're just having you know, they're just like kind of blooming and this might scare the Islamophobes who, I don't know if you have Islamophobes who listen to your podcast, but American Muslims are thriving and we're, we're thriving in part because we had to go on this microscope of scrutiny and we had to ask ourselves, who are we? What do we stand for? How do we relate to trends in Islam that are historic or that are percolating in other parts of the world? So this is a rich moment. It's a rich moment because we've had to self-examine. We'll, we'll continue to have to self-examine. Um, I That's think a, if we, yeah, I I'll I'm, stop there. No, no, no. It's a, it's a, a I mean, it, thank you so much for that question, I mean, for that response, because you, you allowed me to kind of think about the idea that, you know, consternation or examination uh, from, from the outside can lead to not only introspection, but can re really le can also lead to sort of creative um, uh, or cultural production, right? And and so that's that's a fascinating point. I mean, we we kind of bemoan, as we rightfully should, um, the scrutiny of the state or Islamophobia and so on. But I mean, that has produced, and you're seeing it in the academy and outside of the academy in our Muslim organization and institutions, our civic life, as you said. Uh, we are seeing the response to that, and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I just I was fortunate to spend the the day gardening before we hopped onto this conversation, and part of what I was doing was like trimming and pulling away dead growth. And you, it's in a tradition, you have to do that. You have to say, no, this is a harmful direction that we're moving. No, we reject that. No, this is the direction we're moving in, and and that's the you know these things have to be done with with. The, a, a com, you know, an eye for the the communal well being, and with a spirit of inclusivity, and with really deep deep reckoning, and and I think we're still in that process. I, I think you know the next maybe ten years or so, I think are really crucial in terms yeah. of establishing a professional class of of Muslims. Like, who are our imams going to be? Who are you know? Are, will we have female resident scholars in our mosques, or are we going to walk away from you know the spiritual needs of like half of our population in the U.S.? Like all of these questions, really, they're 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 you know at the forefront of my mind anyway. Yeah, I, I think you'll I think you'll appreciate this. I'm I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I mean, but it, one of the things that one of my teachers, you know, Sherman Jackson, who, I, who who we've had on the show, Dr. Jackson, was always mentioning, and now it seems so prescient, like uh, you know, because of the moment we live in now. But you know, he would often say like oppression or persecution has never been the the like sort of number one enemy of religion. Like religion has never. Like uh, the uh, yeah, like mm -hmm. oppression or or uh, scrutiny has never been sort of the uh, uh, the the enemy of religion, but rather apathy, right? Apathy mm -hmm. has been, and and so I think that sometimes in moments where we don't have that eye or scrutiny upon us, we sort of lull ourselves into sort of ap apathy. And I think you know maybe one could argue you know that began happening in the in the nineties. I don't know. Uh, 90s Islam. I mean, I lived it. So, you know, maybe that's an examination worth exploring. But, um, you know, so it kind of really, it, it, it echoes what what you're saying exactly, Dr. Sol yeah, and doc Dr. Jackson is one of the great minds of American Islam, and, and people should read his books, Islam and the Black American, his work on, yeah. on legal, his legal scholarship. Um, yeah, he's just, he he's, uh, yeah, another, I mean, we ha and we have so, this is why I'm, I'm so hopeful about the current mm -hmm. moment is, Great. you know, we have so many people who, who are deeply rooted in their spirituality, deeply wise, and have this really rigorous ab ability to examine the tradition from, um, from historical perspectives. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, you know, the, the other, the thing I do worry about though, is it, for instance, that video that you mentioned at the outset of um, where I'm speaking at Zaytuna College, one of the interesting things to me about that video is that because it started to trend in greater numbers, it started to catch the attention of people 
for whom a woman speaking on the Quran was deeply threatening. And so I sometimes to give myself a comedic laugh, I look at the comments, which are like, how dare she leave her children at home and like abandon her children and, and uh, um, things like who gave this woman a platform and, you know, all these kinds of things. So I think I'm not sure that that's coming so much from the American Islam that I see, but we're as much as we're connected to other global discourses, I think there is a strong backlash against some of these developments. Um, but you yeah. think the, those are coming from outside the U S and not so much from like the, you know, the, the American Muslim community, right. The, the youth these seem very, you know, very um, into the things you're talking about in the sense that very supportive, I should say. Right. Yeah. Well, one of the funny things I was born in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and apparently Allentown, I haven't been back in a while, but apparently Allentown, it has a real strong Muslim presence these days. And I, yeah, I wonder, yeah. Big yes. community with the Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. And, mm-hmm. and I wonder, I wonder if I have just been spending a lot of time in university circles. Have I not gotten into some of these other areas where Islam in, in America is, is flourishing, but maybe in a kind of a different, you know, just with different guideposts as, as to kind of, the, you know, what is the, what is the trajectory? So I, I'd be curious. Do you, I mean, you both have your your, you know, ears to the ground. Ears you to see? the ground, right. <laughs> well, I, I would certainly not judge you as someone sort of like looking down from your ivory tower. I, I, I just, I, not only the way you write, um, I, I find your writing so approachable, um, even for someone who may not be, you know, versed in Islamic studies or coming at it from an academic perspective. So um, I would hardly accuse you of, of sort of being not in touch with what's happening. Um but yeah, I mean, I, I, I share your enthusiasm. I share your excitement in terms of what we're seeing in the community. Um, and, and I, you know, e- even when we talk about Muslim institutions, for example, you know, where, where cases have come up where, you know, let's say leadership has abused its authority when, mm-hmm. or where leadership has misappropriated its, its, its authority and so on, especially within the, within the realm of gender or, you know, like women, like like the, the way interacting men interacting with women, male authority interacting with female subordinates, et cetera, or vice versa. I think we're beginning to see like sort of best practices and code of ethics that are emerging, code of conduct, you know, and so on. So, you know, again, it's, it's like what you mentioned again earlier where, you know, these type of uh, opportunities allow for creative output uh, or the need for creative solutions around these things. Um, yeah, and just could, to, just yeah, to hit on that please. point, though, and yeah. that's if if we're nestled in a culture that has a Me Too type reckoning moment, then that's yeah. going to affect Islamic institutions, right? And that's an as example it, of a positive, as it right? Yeah, exactly. As it should, as it exactly. should, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I just was emphatically agreeing, but please finish your point. Yeah. No, but that that's exactly my point, is that that's an example of a really – really powerful, really needed uh, intervention that didn't come from Muslim circles per se. So had we not had a wider Me Too movement, would would things like, um, you know, male abuse of power have come to light in the same in the same way? And so I think there's an impulse sometimes in our communities to want to like close off to the outside world. But there's ways in which when we are plugged into these wider cultural movements, you know, like, like this, the movement of feminism, right? Like, what can we honestly look at the tradition? And we may not agree with, with mainstream feminist principles on some things, but it could help us see our own blind spots in, in a different way, or this movement for racial justice, right? What does that tell us about right, the moment we live in? <laughs> yeah. 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 And and all those things basically mean we're becoming a more integrated part of the community when the, when the, when the broader issues affect us. In fact, you asked earlier, like, you know, hey, am I saying, you asked kind of us, are, what are we saying? What's our perspective? And it seems like, and I'm a parent of a 14 and eight year old, two girls. Um, my concerns are kind of the same concerns that my friends of other faiths have, right? It's this, so it's not so much like our parents' generation, and we're both Perbez and our, you know, children of immigrants. Their concerns were different potentially from what their, their non-Muslim neighbors' concerns were. But ours are more similar, right? Mm. Um, so 
it's a nuanced question because there's some optis, optimism and then it's peppered with <laughs> some some concern as well, right? Yeah, and part of I think what makes it a little bit difficult in our our young people is are are they able to form Muslim networks where they can kind of speak without having to translate their ideas kind of from from Muslim speak into like a secular speak or I I just think about my own I so I have a 15 year old Mm -hmm. and how important it is for her to be in circles where she can just be a Muslim and it's Mm -hmm. great that she has all of these other friendships and Mm -hmm. you know gets to encounter people across all different you know, parts of the identity spectrum. But but still, I think the more we focus too on how can our youth activities be really engaging and not shy away from these difficult questions, we can't just pretend that our kids, you know, somehow will will not have to face questions about women in Islam or, you know, like yeah. racism in our communities or sexism or what, you know, whatever it is. And, and so I think we have to you know, to thrive, I think we have to be able to address these questions with good answers. I think we have to be able to offer our children spaces in which they feel that justice is being upheld, that human dignity is being upheld. And if we can't do that, they'll walk away. They won't walk away because they don't, you know, they won't walk away from the theological principles. They'll walk away from from Muslim communities because we're not living up to what we should be doing as, as communities. Exactly. And, and, you know, I, I, I didn't do Dr. Jackson's quote justice because, you know, he talks about apathy, you know, born out of ir- ir- irrelevance, mm-hmm. meaning being the biggest threat to religion and religious communi- communal life. And, and that is so true with the statement you just said about our children, especially young people picking up on the hypocrisy of, 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 of not either addressing these issues or turning a blind eye to these issues or pretend that somehow as a community or as, as a faith tradition, we're immune, we're somehow inoculated to all of this, uh, is, is going to lead to that kind of apathy point of irrelevance because we're not speaking on issues that are relevant to young people that are issue, that, that are significant to their lives. So uh, thank you uh, for, again, I mean, like taking this, you know, taking the conversation in this direction, I didn't think we would go here, but I, I really kind of appreciate it. Um, and, and I do want to sort of pivot back to your book as well. Um, so I'm trying to find the right step yeah. way to do that. But I think Omar has a, has a, has a point. And Can I, we just go one more thing on this question? Because I think no, it's no, so listen, urgent. No, no, listen, no means. So fascinating. By the way, I want to, you know, as, you, as you've probably come to appreciate or if you've heard past episodes of the show, we like to keep it very, very sort of free, for, uh, free, for, uh, free style in terms of, you know, the way the interview goes, which is why we don't have like kind of an outline, share an outline with our guest. So feel free to take this conversation anywhere you would like. Um, and we'll get back to your book as much or as much of or as little of it as you'd like to. So it's all yours. Yeah, well, well, no, I just thank you for that because I, I think we're on to something here. And part of what I'm seeing in terms of of youth culture is that there there's a lot of entitlement, right? And I don't I don't know about my daughter, but probably your kids have a pretty comfortable. I mean, I can speak for my daughter. She has a very comfortable life, right? And so some yeah. of yeah. Yeah, some of I'm them. an 18. So, like Omar, I'm the father of two daughters. So, I have an 18 year old and a 12 year old, or going to be 12. And uh, every day, <laughs> every day, we have conversations around entitlement, around wants and needs, and the differences. Yeah. And so, I'm, you I'm are not speaking- being quite as. You're being very structured about it. You're like wants and needs. I'm like, I'm just, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, yeah, not yelling at my kids, of course, but uh, you know, I'm just telling them, really, like you're gonna, yeah. you're gonna ask for that, but you're, it's gonna like you're, yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Sorry, please, uh, Celine. Yeah, but no, my my point to that is, so spirituality is sometimes is born of trial, right? And and I, if I think about what many places in the Ummah are going through, the question is, can I survive this moment? Like it's an existential, can I survive? And our, I think our kids are in a place where they might not have to call on Allah in that like way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it's like how, you know, going back to that question of, of relevance, it's like, yeah. You know where where is that? How do we get them to understand this deep need that you have? That you know nothing else. Your phone is not going to satisfy it. You're you know you're not going to be able to like study your way out of a need for a lost phone with Allah. You're not you know there's no job that you're going to get that it's going to fill, and, and that kind of thing. It, you know absent this 
absent that real existential struggle. And yeah. but you know, some of our youth they have their own. The struggle is is different. You know, it's a struggle against anxiety. It's a struggle against eating disorders. It's a struggle against depression. It's right. Um, you know, which are which are all serious. They're you know they're they're different than than we might find in places abroad. But uh, um, you know, the answer right, the answer is still that deep that deep spirituality and turning turning to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. But they have to have environments in which they hear hear like the way it's, to do that. That is profound. Thank you so much for going there because yeah, that is an absolute. Because what you're talking about essentially, you know, if I can water it down even further, is. Is 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 a, is a theology that speaks to their needs and is relevant to them, right? Mm-hmm. Because, like you said, they're born in these sort of entitled lives where maybe they'll never face an existential threat to their life or well-being, mm-hmm. uh, maybe to their religious way of life. You know, who knows? Uh, and even that may be sheltered or may come through some mediated form. Where, uh, yeah, the need to to turn to Allah to to turn to to, to foster a relationship with one's creator like what what leads to that what necessitates that uh yeah finding that sort of impetus that is a fascinating point you know and and like you mentioned islam and the black american dr jackson's mm-hmm. book you know he talks about theosophy and, and you know black suffering and and so mm-hmm. it's like and and how black community you know bl- black theologians then address the need or address the situations around black suffering and so how do we do that or they to kind of now translate it into the context we're talking about right now how do we ex- talk about theology in a way that is relevant to the suffering you know mm-hmm. and i'm putting that in quotes but because suffering one suffering I like I, I don't like anybody who struggles with anything that's a, that is something that they're struggling with so we're not here to minimize or maximize one problem over another but nonetheless so how do we address the, you know, real human suffering or mm-hmm. identity crisis or struggles with, like you said, depression or, uh, you know, image, you know, image and body image and body shaming and bullying mm-hmm. and so on. So I think mm-hmm. that's a great, great point. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do you think now if we can then pivot back to your book, like how would you, how do you hope that your book can help feed into that conversation? Because what I appreciate is, you talk a lot about theology in the book and, 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 and you're talking a lot about even in fact, the way you're approaching the material is from the vantage point of a theologian, as opposed to a, uh, say a legal scholar or mm-hmm. a, 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 like, right. A faqi. You're rather, you're approaching it really from a theological lens. Mm-hmm. So I, I'd love to kind of maybe pivot or use yeah. this as an opportunity to pivot back to your book. There was a point in the writing of the book where I was working on of Surah Al-Qasas, which addresses um, Musa, Musa his mother, receiving the inspiration to, to th- the instructions from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly to her to nurse her baby and then throw him in the river if she fears or grieves. And as I was working on those passages, this horrifying image of this toddler who whose mother had had put him in the Rio Grande to try to float him um, across. And it was in that moment that the story, you know, like unpacked itself in my mind, and it, and it, you know, it wasn't some like quintessential Disney story, uh, you know, you know, about like a, a, a prince to be. It was like this, this is, this is people's lives. Like mm. the Quran is the stories are it's speaking to us, you know, in our moments as we experience the world. Um, you know, I, you think about the story of uh, again Musa as he's um, he's in this conversation with his father-in-law about you know is he going to work eight years? Is he going to work ten years? Or like this is you know all these little stories they they tell us about our human existence and help us figure out when we're in the midst of struggles, decisions, you know whatever it is. You know, that's why the Quran is is guidance, right? Because it's not it's not just like the the actual explicit guidance. Do this, don't do that. But it's it's also there's guidance, tremendous guidance in the stories that that it tells. But you have to be patient with them. You know, you have to read them over and over and contemplate them. And um, yeah, and that's that's what I I hope 
that the book can do for people as they're reading it. Just, oh, wow, I never thought of that story in that way, or I never made that connection. Or uh, another example is the story of the Viceroy's wife. Um, many people just think about that as, oh, this is just about temptation. And no, it's about the, the um, you know, using power in um, the, the exploitation of status to uh, marginalize people, or it's about, you know, it's about incarceration and about, um, uh, you know, the in, innocent people in prison, which is a contemporary issue. You know, so that's, that's what I'm trying to do. That's, that's great. Yeah. And you, you like the, the, the last story is the, uh, the uh, uh, Egyptian viceroy and the wife of the viceroy, uh, mm-hmm. Imran Tzad Aziz, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the story of Joseph. Um, yeah, and, you know, I, again, and I, and because of the time, because of the time, even I don't know if we'll get to get into as much of the of, of the narratives that you do mention. Um, but I, I guess what I really appreciated about the book, and I would have loved for the readers, or sorry, the listeners, to cap, you know, to to, to sort of leave this conversation with is first of all, go and get a copy and check it out. It, it's very accessible. It's not sort of an academic work alone. I think it's very accessible and can be really read, uh, you know, by by someone who's not in the academy and, and really get a lot out of it. But really what the book is, 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 is an examination of women that are named and unnamed in the Quran, their narratives, their stories. And then from that, you kind of extract exactly what you just did, sort of greater, um, issues and themes that are then explored by, mm-hmm. by virtue or through the means of those narratives. Do I, am I doing That's a good beautiful. job? That's okay. great. Yeah. Thank you. No, no, not at all. I'm trying to do the, the elevator pitch for the book. Um, but I, I guess what, if you could maybe share, as you did, you know, a few more stories or narratives that come to mind that really you think deal with some of the issues that we were just talking about, which is the issues of marginalization or the perception that women somehow, um, you know, the the kind of misogynist approaches that or tropes that often we find sadly in our communities when it comes to women. So, you know, what would I think like our listener be shocked to learn, for example, in the Quran that, that I think would be yeah a good place to start. Yeah. So an example of a misogynist idea that is within our tradition that I don't think is particularly well-founded is that, you know, women leaders are somehow detrimental to their communities. Mm -hmm. And that's not, it's not borne out by sociological evidence on women's leadership. In fact, you find, you know, like, in, in the realm of of the corporate world, like women who serve, like boards that have women on them tend to function better. Companies, I read a recent report about from a, a hedge fund investor that looked at how, what percentage of female founders or co-founders and how their organizations were doing. And in fact, they, they were doing 63% better than companies that didn't have any female founder or co-founder. And so there's interesting ways in which we've, maybe been conditioned as Muslims to look like at, with a degree of suspicion at women who hold positions of authority, um, you know, whether that's religious authority or other types of, of authority. And, you know, the figure that I look to in the Quran for this model is, is Bilqis, the, the Mel- you know, Malik at Saba, the queen of Sheba and the hoopoe bird reports back to King Suleiman alayhi salam, you know, he found a woman ruling over the people. But other than that, you know, nowhere in the story does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, you know, shame, you know, woe to the people of Saba, they have a woman ro- ruling over them or something like this. And and actually, she's, when she asks her advisors, her entourage says, you know, go to war. We're, we're strong. We can take them on. And she uses reason. She uses diplomacy. You know, it has to try different tactics to figure out how to resolve this situation. And the whole way through, she's quite insightful and, and ends up, you know, converting to Islam. And presumably that has some type of impact on the people that she then leads. So, if we if we think about where that does that idea of you know not putting affairs in in the hands of women come from, it, it comes from a hadith that I think is somewhat 
um, poorly interpreted to apply widely when the Prophet Sallallahu seemed to be speaking, seemed to be prophesying about a particular Persian queen who is named, who is known. And somehow in the literature, that particular example gets yeah. expanded. And this yeah. is just one example of so many where we find a you know, a, something specific that gets generalized to all women. And another example is in um, in, the, in the Quran when the Aziz Misr, um, you know, the, the <laughs> says, you know, oh, a woman, your guile is great, essentially. And that principle of women's guile just gets ex- extend, extended out. And yeah. the irony of that is the guy who, who says that, oh, women, your guile is great, is the same guy who throws an innocent man into prison because he wants to suppress a controversy in his court. So, you know, this is, this is not it, a just, statement. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if, it's if not a statement to apply to all women. <laughs> yeah. And if people aren't familiar with, like, women's guile, what you mean by that? I mean, this idea of, like, th- like, th- like, woman's seduction and and the, and the power of that seduction and what that leads to. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I think another thing that I found fascinating in, in, in your book and, or maybe kind of, I, I even talked to my daughters about this, which was interesting because um, I was sort of juxtaposing it with what they often see in uh, popular media or motion pictures, or certainly the Disney trope of the damsel in distress. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and one of the things you examine in your book is where, you know, we don't, we just don't see that trope play out. Mm-hmm. If anything, what we see are instances where men are frustrated or, 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 or struggling or in difficulty, uh, male figures, I should say. Mm-hmm. And then there is a female figure that comes in into the narrative that then offers succor and comfort and advice and wisdom. Um, and, th- and that's, I think, a beautiful other, or I think that's, yeah, a really another part of the sort of narrative around women that we find in the Quran, correct? Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it just brings it full circle for me to say that you were discussing the book with your teenage daughters. Like that to me is the the ultimate success. So thank you for sharing that. So, no, you know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't hurt to get like a back a great book review, but like that is why <laughs> I wrote the book right there. And, and, and truth be told, as I'm listening to this, even I'm thinking about, like I have, Barbiz has two daughters. I have two daughters. They're actually cousins. <laughs> We're right. cousins. We're cousins. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, how can I, rather than focus on she needs to do X, Y, Z, um, how can I get her, the older one? how can I get her to relate more to the stories so that, that she understands that it applies to her? And that's that's my takeaway from this this whole conversation on a personal level. So maybe, you know, just digging back into that a bit, kind of revisiting that concept. Have you, we've talked about the bigger, the bigger reinterpretations or whatever. Have you had a chance to have with uh, either any youth or maybe even your own ch- uh, daughter, uh, that type of conversation where you've said, hey, you know, she's, she's, she needs some coaching or mentoring and you've actually been able to pull in a story. I would, if you can share that, yeah. that'd be amazing. You know, as you answer that though, I would love for you to, because I, knowing this part of the genesis of the book, hearing you talk about this in other media, you know, is that you, your initial, uh, the initial impetus was to explore Muslim jurisprudence um, initially, and then kind of led the, I, I think, I think, what you found there led to you exploring uh, the uh, narratives in the Quran. And I think that really speaks to the exact question that Omar just raised, because I think oftentimes when people talk, talk about even Islam, women in Islam or sexuality in Islam and so on, it's really from the lens of law and fiqh and the mm-hmm. do's and the don'ts rather than kind of exploring it, like you said, from a literary perspective almost um, in the Quran and talking about these narratives. Mm-hmm. So yeah. maybe you kind of bring that two, all together. Yeah, two, two kind of great perspectives on the table there. Um, I, I think when it comes to, again, not only our young people, but us, if we're only experiencing our Muslim identity through the sense of, Oh, I can't go to the bar and I can't, you know, like, like this, this long list, not that I have deep urges to go to bars or something, but, no, like, but the you know, like, of the, yes. of the do's and don'ts. Right? Exactly. Exactly. And so what I, 
you know, rather what I hope people relate to in Islam is, is that source of deep wisdom. But the Quran is difficult, right? You can't just hand it to a person and say, here you go, it's all in there. Um, and, and I think, especially as I was thinking of my daughter, I think I initially tried that approach. I was just like, just start reading the Quran, love, like, it's all there, you'll love it. Um, and, and so I think to have to have the stories in particular, like our kids need to know, you know, the, the basic fiqh, right? But then the, the, you know, like the human mind, it's wired in a way that it lights up for stories, right? Like this is just basic neuroscience. You tell a person a story and so many parts of their brain are, are, are firing. And we have to learn, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a set of stories. We have to, have forums that we can connect our life stories with the way in which the, the the Quran like provides us stories. And that's, I'm really interested in this nexus between using Quranic stories to then open up discussions. And so, you know, maybe, maybe a, um, for, for the example of, of the, Musa's mother, like her receiving revelations to her heart, these instructions to her heart. You know, what is it like to have a discussion with someone about, have you ever felt that? Have you ever felt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was giving you a message? And, you know, like it, it changes the conversation. It changes what Islam is. You know, Islam is not just the things we do regularly or don't do regularly. It's, you know, what what's happening in our heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and the stories just you're even Moses wandering they salam in the desert right we mentioned that kind of before and and he's you know he's so dejected and he's just praying you know for some uh, he's sitting in the shade right praying for for some form of help and so to ask someone when in your life have you felt that or you know this is the actual work of of spiritual formation it's understanding the, the human psyche, understanding our own psyches and understanding what it needs and like how do we turn to Allah in this moment or in that moment or, you know, what are the places, you know, how do we deeply relate to other human beings in, in their struggles? Um, so that, yeah, that's what I'm ultimately interested in. Right. Yeah. No, I, I think that's, I, I think another difficulty and, and you explore this or you certainly talk about this in the in, in the intro, introduction i believe or in the first chapter where you know unlike say perhaps the story of jo- of yusuf uh surah yusuf uh, surah the yusuf uh, that 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 the narratives in the quran are not linear mm-hmm. so it's a little bit hard to kind of piece together and what i appreciate that at least that that your book does is uh within certain themes even you know, when you do mention these narratives, you present them in a way that does, it, it is like a literary, like it is like a narrative as opposed to a disjointed, you know, uh, right. You know what I mean? Like where the stories are presented in the Quran. And so I, I think that also kind of poses a little bit of a difficulty or a hurdle that people oftentimes, I think, uh, initial uh, interlocutors with the Quran mm-hmm. encounter, right? Because mm-hmm. the narratives don't read like biblical narratives. Mm-hmm. Even. Yeah, the, the Quran is just so fascinating in that way. And, you know, we're in the middle of Ramadan, so I'm trying a little bit, inshallah, to increase my reading, right? And the, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm always pausing to think, you know, why, why did it, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala go from that topic to this topic? Like, what is the connection there? Right. And a lot of times in, the, in writing this book, I started to see some of those connections because I would be reading the same ayat over and over and over again. And you notice things, and we're trained as Muslims, I think, to like want to get through a lot of Quran readings or, you know, so we're not necessarily thinking about, okay, this verse in this chapter, and then this verse in this chapter, like, how do they go together? How do they speak to one another? We have more of a, we just kind of consume maybe like a a, a kind of at a different pace, um, many of us. And, And so for me, a lot of this work too was just you know, taking a topic and then really slowing down and, and focusing on that topic. Um, I'm working on a project right now on monotheism in the Quran, which it, somebody asked, you know, a publisher asked me to work on it. And, and so I took it on. Um, but this it kind of is such a basic idea, right? But then and I 
as I started to take out the verses and think about the position in the Mus'haf, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala start it, at Surah Al-Baqarah and, you know, end at, at the um, in Surah Al-Nas? And why, you know, also all these questions, if you're a person of, of deep contemplation, that's a, a, just, a, you know, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the information in the way that, that he does? That's a question that will occupy me uh, all my days, I think. All right. So, so uh, that's really interesting. So, so you, you referred to upcoming, upcoming um, work, right? So, mm-hmm. is is are you going to stay focused very much on this topic, or are you s- kind of segging into uh, some other areas like you just referred to? Yeah, last Ramadan, it was the last 10 days of Ramadan and a publisher reached out to me and I thought, well, this feels like, you know, one of those moments I'm like, I think this is what I need to work on next. And it was, in fact, that topic of of monotheism. And for me, it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calling me to work on the basics. You know, I had I had worked on this like kind of niche topic for a while. I still have a lot of work that I want to do on monotheism or on, on men and gender in the Quran because I reached a limit to what I could do on women figures without doing the same rigorous, substantial inquiry into into men. Um, so that might be my next after this work on monotheism, inshallah, if Allah gives me ban- bandwidth and if my family doesn't uh, go nuts about how much time I'm spending writing books. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And we would we are eagerly looking forward to that. Um, before I, I Before we, like, leave before we conclude um i i personally would think would be it would be remiss of us not to touch on uh, one last aspect in your book that 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 i would like to before we conclude and that is like you talk about uh uh paradisal like paradisal paradisal would it be pronounced Mm -hmm. paradisal beings uh angelic beings in the you know in in the in paradise uh specifically also the 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 uh, uh, the huris so called mm-hmm. huris in the Quran and and I I would love for you to kind of maybe comment on that because I think within the conversation around these beings which to the outsider may seem as well that's just the same age old trope of women being sexual objects for men and so on but that's not really what the like that, that's not really what the purpose or what you explore with regards to Hurain or, or Huri. So I'd love for you to kind of talk about that because I think our listeners would love to know that you do address that in the book as well, which is this idea of like women as sexual beings or sexualized objects. Um, so I, I think that's a very important yeah. conversation to have. And, and like I said, we'd be remiss not to, to like to leave without talking about it at least. Yeah, exactly. So some things on that coming from a Christian dominated milieu, there's a certain um, reticence to think about positive images of sexuality in a religious context. And so (laughs) that's strange for people. And um, I think coming into Islam, I was pleasantly surprised to see narrations about you know this is how the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam conducted sexual affairs and and he did have uh, a different uh, wives and things and so i had to you know coming from the context that i did i had to really think deeply about these tropes and how to understand them within um kind of with, within my own cultural context. Mm-hmm. And so with the with the Hurain, what I try to show is that nowhere in the Quran does it talk about women in paradise. So we have all these books, women in paradise, women in paradise. There's no Nisa, there's no Imra, there's no, right? And so when when the Quran does talk about paradise, it talks about azwaj and zawj, which are mates, you know, con- like the the hum- the word zawj itself, it's not even inherently gendered. You have to be able to, you know, you, if you just say zawj, you don't know if you're talking about a husband or a wife or... Right. Um, like so, with the uh, subhanallah, the uh, like the the ayah in, in Yasin, right? Like glory, glory be to God who has created as mm-hmm, like, uh, mm-hmm, yeah. right? And so there, it's not like you said, it's not gendered inherently. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the fascinating part about as is that it's not a term that means husband or wife specifically. It can mean that, but. It, but it means like one of a kind or a, or a pair or a, a type of something. Mm. And so when we come to 
to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about paradise in, in the Quran, we find only the words uh, for spouse, like azwaj, zawj, used. So that that's significant for, for one. There is no women uh, in, in paradise. The adjectives, the only way the Hur'ain get a, f- a feminine mystique about them is because they are adjet- the adjectives are in the feminine form in 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 Arabic. And so part of that is because the, the nefs, the enfus, that's what is in paradise. It's not, there's no human beings. There's no like bashar in paradise. It's enfus and nefs and in some type of new, newly created state. And so what I say is sometimes in places where translators of the Quran moving to English will put in a word maiden or something like that, they're, they're in fact interpolating meaning in, and it is a feminine adjective, but in some places those feminine adjectives can are just feminine because they're describing and the enfus, which is mm. feminine term. I mean, this is hard. You don't. I break it down pretty clearly in the book. No, um, no, you do. But you did an excellent job there. No, that that's actually like tying it back to the the enfus or the nefs being inherently, well, at least etymologically speaking, feminine. So uh, obviously, with the way the Arabic grammar, the way Arabic grammar is structured, the adjectives describing that thing would then be feminine as well. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So that's a that's an excellent point. I think also, and I don't know if you explored this in the book, but I think when we talk about paradise, or frankly, for that matter, even hellfire, uh, a lot of the descriptions that we do find, whether it's in the Quran or the Hadith tradition, are very sensualized. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think there's a purpose for that that's broader than the context of sex or pleasure or anything like that. I think the broader context is perhaps... I mean, God knows, Allahu Alam, of course, but 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 God, you know, again, that's a way of being instructive to human mm-hmm. beings who tend to view these things um, in these heightened or sensualized mm-hmm. descriptions. Does that make sense? I mean, I don't. Yeah, know. yeah, absolutely. And we, as like moderns, tend to think ourselves uh, beyond this. I don't. I don't need fear of chastisement. I don't. Know. You know, I don't need, I don't need a heaven or hell. Like I, I need a concept of heaven and hell at some times in my life. Like I, I definitely need these things. And so I, I think, I mean, different saints in our tradition have kind of moved beyond, you know, it's just purely about like love of God. And that's like that desire to the love of God or the absence of God. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Mm -hmm. exactly. But, you know, I, I think for a lot of, a lot of people, I think like these, you know, whether, whether people think of them as like states of contentment, um, you know, or, or states of discontentment. Like I have, I have felt times in my life where, oh, this feels like hell, right? Like I'm the, we have that concept as human beings that, we have a sense or we know pain. We know these things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a taste of what pleasure is. And even in our worldly existence, right, we take, we, we taste it. And part of what makes it pleasurable is because it, it, it is going away, right? Like yeah. that's the, that's it. And um, so I, I think if we move too far away from the need you know, if we somehow think ourselves beyond the need for these things, we're, we're a little bit deluding ourselves. Yeah, and not only that. I mean, that's a fascinating. I, I thank you for that answer because not only do we, if we move away from the need for um, talking about heaven and hell in the in a real physical sense, mm-hmm. but I think it's also instructive what you mentioned, which is that you have in our tradition, um, you know, material or or analyses around these things that may be more sensualized, what have you, descriptive perhaps, but in other contexts, very sort of metaphorical or, you know, paradise is the presence of God, hellfire being the absence of God. And so you sort of have it all. It's, it's mm-hmm. sort of like a buffet, right, available to you. And depending on what kind of eater you are, you're going to approach the buffet differently. And if the Quran is with the nas is, is a source of guidance for all of humanity, uh, then, then the, the reader, it has to be able to engage uh, all types of, of, of readers. 
And I think that's what it's doing. So some people need the descriptive, other people uh, in the sensualized, mm-hmm. other people need the perhaps the more esoteric or mm-hmm. the more metaphorical. So thank you yeah. for kind of yeah elucidating on that. Um, well, and that's also different stages in our life too. Like yeah, right. we're, we're there you go. like middle age, but I don't know if we <laughs> if we make it to old age, like older age, I'm these old things age. might read different. <laughs> these things <laughs> might read differently. <laughs> Quick question, um, just as we get close to wrapping, uh, you've talked about a lot of great ideas that you, you, you've talked about and you, you, you referred to presenting in the book. How has the support been? Um, and I mean support from kind of not just not just critics of uh, you know book reviews, but in, actually in terms of like scholars in our community, are you getting the support or, that you 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 that you're looking for? Or just the male, and male scholars, even male scholars yeah. specifically. Yeah, yeah. Was I that for this? No, I was just going to say scholarship, but also just the community at large. Yeah. Right? I mean, anybody reading the book. I mean, I'd love to kind of hear you, what the response has been like from the Muslim community of people who have engaged your book. Uh, is, is from it a meeting? scholarly perspective or just, you know, a lay person? That's and response good. in terms of whether it's meeting your expectations. Like, have you been, are you getting the support that you, you, you're looking for? Yeah, I think part of the reason why a number of female scholars end up in the academy is that it is harder to make headways in among maybe um, for scholar, like among the scholarly class that sees itself as kind of the imams and the sheikhs of the ummah. I, I don't, I have not yet heard back from many people who I think would really benefit from reading what I do in the book in terms of it could enrich their lectures, it could enrich their khutbahs. Mm. I've received a lot of support from academics, you know, male and female alike, but a lot of people really taking the work seriously. And I and I really appreciate that. And I think it signals somewhat of a shift in the culture of the academy as well. Um, I you know, I'm just really speaking frankly here. I don't think that our communities, the the leadership of our communities as a whole, I can think of a number of individuals who who are very supportive. But if I if I think, uh, I think people might feel a little threatened by the work before even opening it. It's just the sense yeah. of some, you know, woman educated in a Western institution who thinks she can write on the Quran is is the kind of. Um, vibe I get from some male scholars. Um, and that's not all of them, but I just, I felt to be a little honest with you in that in No, that context. Well, we love people being honest and, and the candor that people have, have expressed or been able to express on the show. Uh, but it's one of the things we've sort of prided on with regards to the format of this podcast is, you know, we've had guests, you know, sort of express themselves very candidly. Um, but I think that's a fast, again, another fascinating point, which is this, sort of double consciousness almost mm-hmm. in the in this sort of uh the boy you know the way uh wb du bois talks about it within the black american context being that on the one hand as an academic you are there's this need for you to be impartial and objective and so hence you're writing about women you're writing about muslim like women in the uh, in in the in the muslim tradition in islam and here you are as a muslim so automatically you're having to deal with all of that mm-hmm. right and and all of the baggage that, that 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 comes with is not being taken as a serious scholar mm-hmm. because you are a woman and you are a muslim woman talking about these issues and then from the outside you know then or from the out, outside of academia from the Muslim community then being seen as a perceived threat just simply because you are a Muslim scholar mm-hmm. writing about these things from a Western academic perspective. So it's that double consciousness, right? That you have yeah. to really, that you really struggle with uniquely uh, as being a Muslim woman academic. And so, uh, no, I, I appreciate you, you, you sort of saying that. So what do you think needs to change then yeah, not, only, just not very, with leadership, but with our discourse, where we can be more mature about these things. Yeah, very in a very concrete way. If there are imams who are listening to this podcast, if people work as imams, they should write me. I will send them a copy of the book because it will enrich their khutbas, inshallah. And and you know we don't compensate our imams fairly. We just it, and it's shameful, really. And if you. Um, you know, so I'm really sensitive to that and I want to make it really accessible to people. So if there are imams listening to this, they should definitely I'm, I'm gonna write put me. Rez, 
I'm going to put Perez on the spot. He gives the he gives the chutzpahs at uh, our San Jose mushes uh, every Friday. <laughs> so uh, not every uh, Friday, I, but I mean, that would be that would be I torture. Think, yeah, I think Dr. Well, Ibrahim's going to be expecting you to refer to her uh, her book in your next chutzpah now. So you know when I'm in interfaith audiences and they ask me about you know are you, since you're a woman and a scholar and are don't you feel like marginalized because you don't get to give Friday uh, you know Friday chutzpah Friday sermons yeah. and I usually say I can lecture at any other hour of the week and you know and inshallah I'll find people who are interested in in the things that 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 I think are important but. You know, the flip side of that is I really do hope that that people who have access to pulpits take some of this work seriously because, yeah. uh, you know, that's still it is it's still an important way of getting out information to, to our communities. Absolutely. And 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 I, and I want to thank you. And I, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this with the audience. I mean, you know, you reached out to us via email, um, you know, and, and to me, that gesture alone, you know, um, you know, wanting to talk about the book on the show and, and, and that gesture alone, knowing even, I don't know how much you know about the podcast or who our audience is, but I, I imagine you would, you probably perceived us or saw us as a podcast, a Muslim podcast, and by and large, our listeners are Muslim. And so it's like, this to me was a demonstration of you wanting to engage with the community at large. And I think people should take that really as a, as, as a, as a welcome sign from where we have scholars in the academy, serious scholars in the academy who are wanting to engage the Muslim community at large. Because I think that certainly as someone who studied you know, Islamic academically over a decade ago, that was less the case, and it was few and far in between where I saw Muslim scholars who were willing and 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 really um, put themselves out there to engage the Muslim community at large, whereas by and large there was this sort of reticence to do so or because they felt marginalized. And we can certainly talk about the likes of people like Fazl Rahman and other people in the past who, who did, who were marginalized by the Muslim community, uh, unfortunately. And so um, thank you for that, uh, Celine, Dr. Ibrahim, yeah. for making yourself so accessible. Um, I, I am curious, though, like, I, I, where, did, where did our show cross your radar? I mean, I, I just asked that as a, you know, because this is our content, we're putting this out there. So I'm yeah. curious where people are finding out about the show and and, and where you're hearing about it. So sometimes people send me things because they're listeners and say, they say, I would love to hear you on, on this show. And I, I tend to get people ask me like, you should, you should do this. I would love to hear you on that. And as my family know, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to put my, self out there because the by virtue of putting yourself out there you do get the haters and you do get the negative criticism and all of this and I try not to let that distract me from kind of what what I think is an important you know mission of helping people connect to the Quran and help people you know helping our communities be more just and inclusive and and cognizant of um you know of the great gifts that that we have and and I it's such a moment in history. I said this before, but we are witnessing the the blooming of Islamic scholarship. And a lot of it is in the English language. So it is super accessible to us. We're super resourced. We have the ability to sit around and read, you know, most of us for, for a good bit of the day. So I just, you know, want to encourage your listeners to keep digging in and especially in this this Ramadan, inshallah, to to make use of these last days. Well, well, thank you. I, I think you, without saying so, I think you basically gave permission to our listeners to uh, bug people who they would love to have on the show and send them emails and say, you got to be on Diffuse Congruence and talk about your book or talk about your project. So, uh, yeah, but <laughs> jokes aside. How did, you, how did you go with the name of the show? You probably, your listeners might know this, but. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, no, that's a great question. I think you'll appreciate this as a Muslim academic. Uh, it, it, that's actually, I always say it's a Jacksonian term. Uh, it's Dr. Jackson. Uh, describing or explaining the uh, the idea or the concept of tawatur, mutawatur, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as being diffused congruence. Oh, okay. The idea where there's diffusion, yet mm-hmm. there's some general sense of congruity between the various narrations uh, within a, a tawatur reporting. So uh, I, I kind of, I love the sound of that. And, I, and, and that really kind of, in, in many ways, is the purpose of the show. We want to highlight the diversity of the Muslim community Yet by doing so, we are uh, finding 
the that sort of beautiful congruity, you know, within the community as well, that even though we come from such different perspectives, Muslim backgrounds of like people born into the faith outside of, you know, not born into the faith. And yet, you know, there is this sense of congruity as well, congruence as well. So that's hope that explains. Yeah, I love it. And, it. and it also calls us to be able to sit in that space of practicing yes. Islam slightly differently and still finding ourselves, exactly. you know, able to have that relationship. Yeah. Diversity. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. That there is a diffusion as well. So, mm-hmm. uh, no, um, Oh, Omar, I don't know if you have anything else that you wanted to ask. Uh, no, just, um, you know, you, you clearly are receptive to engaging. So where can people find you if they do want to engage? Oh, Great. thank you. Well, my website is selineibrahim.org and there's a place there where you can send me messages. And I do try to read them and I, I try to respond to people. And if anyone on your show experiences financial hardship too, and would like a copy of the book, I'd really like to make that available to people too. So they should, and I, I might not be able to fulfill every single order, but I will try to, to, to get as many uh, copies out there as I can, inshallah. Well, thank you, and we and we hope that you do have a return to the Bay Area, whether it's Saytuna or through through some other means. Uh, we'd love to see you out here, and uh, next time we could maybe sit in person and, and do this recording as a follow up. So, thank you so much for making yourself accessible in these final days of Ramadan. Thank you as always, uh, and listeners. If you want to engage us, as always, you can send us an email. Good old fashioned email, diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can hit us up uh, on social media via Twitter or Facebook. Uh, you can become a monthly, a monthly patron of the show. Um, and we always uh, encourage people to do that. It, makes, uh, uh, it gives us the opportunity and the ability to do more of this content that you like and you love to listen to. Um, and you can do that at patreon.com slash diffusecongruence. Thank you, Dr. Selena Ibrahim, for joining us. And thank you for our listeners for listening. I'm <laughs> <laughs>